Part 10. For real? This is going to be probably the last chapter of this series, at least for the foreseeable future. Maybe at some point down the road I'll revisit it, but never in a million years did I think that I was going to get to 10 parts of this series. In fact, this was never even intended to be a series. This was just a one-off video I made last summer, and it did really well. You guys seemed to really enjoy it. I had a lot of fun making it, so I was like, okay, let's make a part two, and a part three, and a part four, I guess. And now here we are, 10 months later, with part 10 of five scams that have become so normalized, we don't even notice their scams anymore. We're gonna start off hot here with a scam that I myself have actually fallen victim to in the past, and that is HR departments. In a previous episode of this series, I addressed corporate culture as a whole, and I referred to it as being incredibly intellectually dishonest, and I totally stand by that. I think that the idea of associating your entire identity, or at least a large part of your identity, with the job that you hold for a company you work for is not a good way to live your life, to say the least. I provide the people of this community with propane and propane accessories. But I just think that corporate culture as a whole is fake and that so much of it involves just going along with a narrative that nobody actually buys into. But I think that HR departments deserve a shout out of their own. When I had my first few jobs when I was a teenager or in my early 20s, I had a couple different retail jobs and I remember being told that if I had any concerns about anything that happened in the workplace that HR was the place to go to talk about it. Human Resources Department. <laughs> Human Resources Department. If I had concerns about my pay, if I had concerns about the benefits I was entitled to, if I had concerns about the way that I was being treated by another employee or by a manager, HR was seen as the liaison basically between the company and the employees. It was pitched to me as though the purpose of human resources was to protect the employees from being taken advantage of or mistreated on the job. In fact, the way that this was initially explained to me actually led me to believe that HR wasn't a part of the corporation that I was working for, but was maybe like a third party agency or a third party company of some sort who just served to kind of mediate between the employees and the employer, which on the surface sounds like a great idea. And well, as I obviously came to find out later on, that's not true at all. Human resources departments are pretty much always a part of the company that employs you and their job, despite what they might want you to believe, is not to advocate for you, not to protect you, not to mediate for you, but to make sure that the company doesn't get sued by you. The only reason that HR departments even exist is to protect the company from liabilities, not to protect you at all from anything. But the way that HR is presented, the way that it's talked about, the way that HR departments try to interact with the employees would lead you to believe something entirely different. So much so that even though most people are well aware of the fact that HR departments are sections of the company, they're parts of the company that they work for, somehow they're still led into believing the idea that they are there to help you, and they're not. So don't be so naive, like I was. For me, this epiphany came when I was about 19 or 20 years old, and I was working at a big box retailer. I had actually just got hired, I just started working there. And on my very first day on the job, one of the assistant store managers ripped into me, and he was completely in the wrong, it was a total misunderstanding, but the way that he talked to me, especially as a brand new employee, but overall, was completely inappropriate, and I was really, really upset about it. I was very young at the time, and I didn't deserve that. I mean, I don't think anybody deserves to be spoken to that way by a manager ever for any reason, but just the power dynamic of being brand new and being young and trying to present myself in a good way at this job and having this person just talk to me so terribly, I was completely shaken by it. And I remember after my first week, the HR lady called me in to just ask how things were going in the first week and thinking that I could open up to her, thinking that her job was to try to make sure that my employment was successful there and that I was being treated well, I told her what had happened. And to my shock, instead of her taking the appropriate actions, which would have been to either reprimand that manager or to force him to apologize to me or to take some sort of action to resolve what had happened, she immediately jumped to his defense without even ever hearing his side of the story. Me just simply saying like, hey, this is what happened. This is what I said. And he just tore into me in front of everybody. And she immediately started defending his behavior. And that's when I realized that that is her job. Her job is to try to defend the company and, and defend the managers to make sure that they can't get themselves into any serious trouble ever. You can only make fun of things that they have control over. Like Oscar is gay. That is his choice. I've always been a pretty skeptical person. I've always been a bit of a contrarian. Not a surprise to anybody, I'm sure. But that moment was a big learning opportunity for me where I realized that really like trust your gut. My instinct was always to say like HR departments, if they are parts of the company, 
then what do they have to gain by trying to help me? Like that was my instinct. And I was told by other people like, oh no, if you have a concern, you go to HR, they're there to help you. And I had my doubts about that from the start, but that moment really cemented that for me and the idea that when it comes to corporate culture, HR is absolutely no exception. They're not there to help you. They're not there to advocate for you and you should not trust them. The fact that they even call it human resources in itself is such bullshit because they don't exist to provide resources to humans. They exist to prevent humans from attacking the corporation. HR departments are an out and out scam. Don't trust them. Don't believe anything they tell you. Learn to protect and advocate for yourself because your employer is never going to do it for you. But as it turns out, HR departments are far from the only ones who are out to exploit you. In fact, nobody does that better than data brokers, whose entire purpose is collecting and selling your personal information, including things like your full name, your address, and even your health records, to pretty much anybody who's willing to buy it, leaving you at risk of things like hacking, fraud, and even identity theft. Like, have you ever tried Googling yourself? Honestly, some of the stuff that comes up might just alarm you. But thanks to Aura, who's also sponsoring today's video, it has become easier than ever to ensure that you stay protected from scammers and spammers online. Aura does the hard work for you by constantly scanning the web and notifying you of which brokers have access to your information and then submitting removal requests on your behalf so your private information stays private and secure. In addition, Aura also comes stocked with numerous other features to help keep you safe online like antivirus, VPN, password management, identity theft insurance, and more, all built into one easy to use app and all for one very reasonable price. So if you value your privacy as much as I value mine, head over to aura.com slash according to Nicole, or click the link in the description box down below to get started with a free 14 day trial. Scam number two that we're about to talk about is probably one of the biggest scams in modern society and how it has not made it into the first nine videos up till now, I couldn't even tell you, but it is the American healthcare system, or rather the lack thereof. As a Canadian, I will never be the one to say that our healthcare system is perfect here because it's definitely not. But what I can tell you with certainty is that if you walk into the ER and you're in a life or death situation, you're in big trouble, you're gonna be seen immediately, you're gonna be taken care of, and you're not gonna leave with a bill. And the exact same thing could be said about basically every other developed country in the world, except the good old USA. America, fuck yeah. If you ask any Canadian, any Brit, any European, any Australian, any New Zealander, New Zealander, Kiwi, any Kiwi. If you ask anybody from any other developed country in the world what they think about American healthcare, they will tell you how absolutely obscene it seems. Going into six or seven figures of medical debt because your baby was born with a birth defect or having to start a GoFundMe so you can afford chemotherapy when you're diagnosed with cancer or whatever other nightmare situations Americans find themselves in, it just doesn't even sound like real life. How is it even possible that the greatest country on earth, air quotes, very much needed there, can't seem to get it together when every other developed country is doing just fine? I mean, I think it really says it all that you guys literally have a TV show about a high school chemistry teacher who has to start manufacturing industrial quantities of crystal meth just to pay for his cancer treatment. And I know it's just a show, but still. But just because something is outrageous or unbelievable doesn't inherently make it a scam, right? So what makes US healthcare a scam? Well, the fact that there's no government intervention, which means that drug companies can charge as much as they want. When you go to a hospital there, they can't even tell you in advance what something's going to cost you before you have to get the treatment. Because the US government doesn't provide medical insurance, they have no incentive to negotiate with drug companies or hospitals and try to put caps on what they can actually charge for their products or services because they just don't care. Because the provincial government here is the one that provides the health insurance and pays for the medical care, they put caps on how much a hospital can bill them for a certain procedure or how much a drug company can charge for a particular medication. And by no means should you feel bad for the doctors. Like they're still getting paid plenty of money, like multiple six figures, they're doing just fine. But the US government doesn't seem to care that their citizens are getting price gouged on things that they need to survive, which is insane. And the part of this that makes it the most insane and the biggest scam is that when you bring up this conversation, there's always some guy like in the middle of Missouri or something, some guy named Joe with a fourth grade education and two teeth in his mouth, shaking his fist at the sky going, I don't want to pay more taxes. I don't want the government to control my medical care. Whatever. The idea that single payer healthcare would increase the yearly expenses for the average American has been debunked time and time again. When you guys go out and you get your own private health insurance, most of you are paying several hundred dollars a month for health insurance, plus deductibles, plus all these exclusions, plus all these restrictions, making it so incredibly complicated. You are already spending so much more money than you would be, even if there was a tiny tax hike to cover single payer healthcare. Like I can guarantee you that you guys are spending more on your healthcare than I'm spending on mine via my taxes, by far. 
There's also a rumor that here in Canada and in other countries where there's socialized medicine that we just pay more taxes to be able to pay for those services. And that's also simply not true. Like I can tell you myself, I pay about 25 to 30% of my income, usually not even 30% of my income in taxes every year. And to my knowledge, 25 to 30% is seen as a pretty average rate for North America as a whole, for the US as well as it is here. So we're not actually really paying any more money than you guys are paying. The question is, what are you getting for your tax money? Like I pay my 25 or my 30% and I know what I'm getting out of it. And I know that healthcare is one of those things. You guys are paying the same amount and you're not even getting that. And then you're going and spending hundreds of dollars additional every single month for your medical coverage. And then you still have to pay deductibles. And you guys are actually paying a lot more money overall than we ever have. And then there's the fact that your government seems to be able to come up with unlimited bailouts for corporations like Boeing and Ford and other failing businesses in the multiple billions of dollars range which would more than cover healthcare for the entire country, but instead of taking care of its citizens, they'd rather just bail out an airplane company or something. This video is not intended to be political, but realistically, I believe that everything in life is political. Everything goes back to politics because everything goes back to money and money and politics are completely intertwined. So this is not intended to be a political rant, but at the end of the day, the US healthcare system is an out and out scam because they have convinced the entire country that they are better off not having health coverage, that they are getting some sort of advantage or they're saving money or they're getting access to a better level of care. And as somebody who has lived in Canada my entire life, who has seen myself and family members require expensive medical procedures and dealing with emergencies and needing different medications and different things, I can tell you firsthand that you've been scammed. Okay, on a slightly, but not very much lighter note, let's talk about scam number three, which is bottled water. It is weird to me to think that in the year 2024, bottled water is still a very popular thing. I kind of understand its purpose in certain situations. I understand buying a bottle of water when you're away from home or when you're somewhere where there isn't access to a clean source of refill water, but bottled water in its idea, in its existence is a scam because water is a natural resource, right? Water comes from rivers and springs and things that are a part of the earth. And then companies like Nestle or Polar Springs or whoever else basically go and colonize nature and they take something that inherently belongs to all of us equally. They don't own a spring, they don't own a river, like that's just part of the earth. And they colonize it and they take it and they bottle it and then they sell it back to the people who already own it, which is us. To me, the idea seems as bizarre as like if you went to a public park and decided that all the grass in that park belonged to you and that if people wanted to stand on that grass or sit on that grass and have a picnic, they had to pay you for it. And you're like, but wait a minute, this park belongs to all of us. We all pay taxes here. We all live in this community. This park belongs to us. You can't sell us access to something that we already own just by nature. But hey, Nestle and a number of other companies are doing just that. And well, how have they been successful in doing this? How have they managed for decades now to convince us all that we should give them money for something that we don't have to actually pay for, that comes basically for free or nearly free out of every tap in the world? They've done it by basically demonizing tap water, by convincing us all that there's things in our tap water that's gonna hurt us, that's gonna kill us, that's gonna give us cancer. And of course, for the most part, that's not true. There are definitely some places in the world where there are issues with water quality. I'm not disputing that at all. And in those cases, it makes perfect sense to have bottled water or some other source of clean water accessible to you. But water is a human right. Like we would all, all of us, humans, animals, plants, the earth, we would all die without it. So the idea of taking capitalism and injecting it into something that none of us can survive even a day without seems absolutely absurd and just seems like peak late stage capitalism that has led us to basically where we are right now, where everything is melting down all the time. According to bottled water companies, the fluoride or chlorine or whatever other minerals are in your tap water are probably gonna harm you, but the microplastics and BPA that you're ingesting from drinking the water from their plastic bottles definitely won't because science, right? Yeah, Mr. White. Yes, yeah, science. I'll tell you straight up that where I live currently, the water is not great. It's very, very hard and it's very heavily chlorinated and it doesn't smell great and doesn't taste great, but it's a very easy solution. You just have to run it through a filter. I have a filtration system attached down to my main water intake in the basement. I also use a Brita in my fridge. I've also used an RO system at other points. Like there's different filters that you can buy that are available to you. And in most cases, even putting out the money for a high end water filtration system in your home is gonna cost you significantly less over the long run than just buying bottled water nonstop all the time. Because like how many bottles of water does the average person drink in a day? Multiple, right? It's super inconvenient. You have to go lug these giant cases of water into your house. You're paying a premium for something that is actually not better for you and something that you really shouldn't be having to pay for in that way, at least at all. 
I think that the colonization and the corporatization of nature is something that we're going to start seeing a lot more of. And it's probably already happening in many more ways than you and I are even aware of. But I just think that it's an absolutely insane idea that a company can decide that they own something or that they can take something that exists naturally in the world and then package it and sell it to you as though it's some sort of something that you have to pay for. Just a wild idea. And as usual, it's a scam. The next scam on the list is one that I have been thinking about for almost my entire life. Like basically, since I was old enough to have any of my own money and start spending any of my own money, this is something that I have thought about and kind of obsessed about and kind of been fascinated with, but in the worst way possible. And that is sales tax. What you pay sales tax on and how much sales tax you pay differs obviously widely depending on where in the world you live. Depends on the country you live in, depends on the state or the province you live in. Here in Ontario where I live, sales tax is 13%, which is quite high. Now, by no means am I one of those people who's like, oh, taxation is theft, get the government out of my wallet. It is no surprise, of course, that the government wants to take their cut out of every transaction and every purchase and every sale. I get it. The part of it that I think is the craziest, though, is when you start to reverse engineer this idea of sales tax through the production and distribution line of a product. When you do this, when you think about an end product and then start going backwards into the way that it was produced and where all the materials and everything came from and how sales tax is applied through that entire process, you start to realize that the vast majority of the price that we pay for everything is actually just sales tax. Like, let's take, for example, a guitar. Okay, random example. You take a guitar. If I go to a store, I go to a music store and I buy a guitar, and let's say that guitar is $1,000, I have to pay 13% of that. So that is $130 that I'm going to be paying in sales tax. But that guitar was also subject to sales tax when the store that sold it to me bought it from their distributor. And when their distributor bought it from the manufacturer, Gibson or Fender or whatever company they bought it from. And when Gibson or Fender bought the raw lumber from the lumber yard, or they bought the electronic components for the pickups, or they bought the wire for the strings or the metal for the whatever, like all of those raw materials came with sales tax. And chances are that the people who harvested those raw materials in the first place also had to pay sales tax in the process of doing that. So you find somewhere, you know, a lumber yard or a metal miner or whatever, and they're paying sales tax to extract and harvest those resources. And then they're charging it plus sales tax to the manufacturer who takes it and turns it into an item and then sells it with sales tax to the distributor who then takes it and sells it plus sales tax to the store who then takes it and sells it to the consumer with sales tax additional. And I feel like if that wasn't a thing, how much cheaper would each item be? Like every time 13%, 13%, 13% is added on, it can easily double the price of an item through all of those different steps in the process. And even if you live somewhere with a lower sales tax rate, even if it's only around say 5%, that still compounds very quickly all the way through the supply chain. And I can only imagine that this only becomes more prevalent the more components something has or the higher price it is. If you think about something like a car, a car has so many different materials and things on it. It has paint in it, it has metal, it has fiberglass, it has plastic. And all of those individual things had to be sold to the next part of the supply chain with sales tax added in. And then again, they sell it to the end consumer who has to pay sales tax on it yet again. And then when you sell that car, right? If you have an old car and you decide to sell it and get a new one, when you sell that old car to another person on the internet or wherever, they have to pay sales tax again. It just seems crazy to me to think about. I don't know what the solution is here. I feel like it would be more fair if the tax was just on the end product. So rather than having to pay tax on all of the raw materials the whole way along. But then when you think about that, every product is an end product to somebody. To somebody who works in a lumber yard, chopping down trees and making wood, that wood is the end product that they're selling, right? To somebody who makes guitars and then sells those guitars or those cars or the furniture or whatever it is, to a store that is the end product for them. And I feel like I just went down a mental rabbit hole that I'm never gonna find my way out of. Is the math mathing here? Am I crazy? Am I missing something? Do I have it right? Are we all just paying like 90% sales tax on everything we buy, but it's just broken up in a way that it doesn't seem like it's as much as it is? I don't know. I feel like this is a scam. And finally, one that has been mentioned many times in the comments and that I absolutely could not overlook, scam number five on today's list, scam number 50 overall in this series, which is wild, is the lottery. Lotteries by design take advantage of people's desperation and destitution. And in fact, everything I'm about to say can by and large be applied to the gambling industry as a whole, but the lottery specifically seems to target low income people, people who are down on their luck and who are feeling desperate and who are just looking for a quick fix to their financial situation. And of course, logically, it's not ever a good decision. 
Lottery tickets and other forms of gambling are an addiction for a lot of people because they become addicted to the thrill of that potential win and addicted to the idea that, well, somebody's gonna win, it could be me. And it's a really, really asinine way to look at things, but I also recognize that addiction isn't always a logical thing. By no means am I trying to imply that everybody who gambles or purchases lottery tickets are addicts. Of course they're not. I've purchased lottery tickets a couple times in my life as well, but I've done it for fun. I've done it probably three or four times in my entire life at most in total. And I've done it with the idea that I know I'm not gonna win. And maybe if I'm lucky, I'll get 20 bucks. Like I'm not going into this thinking I'm gonna win the Powerball or the Lotto Max or whatever else. Just in case there's anybody watching this video right now who needs to hear this, I'm really sorry to break it to you, but you are not going to win the lottery. It's just not gonna happen. Whether you buy one ticket a week or one ticket a year or 500 tickets every day, you're not gonna win. And it's a weird idea to go through life thinking, well, somebody's gotta win because there are a lot of fluke situations that can happen to people in their life. But you don't go through life thinking, well, somebody's gonna get struck by lightning, might as well be me. Like that's not a logical way to look at life. There are studies that show that as economic situations worsen, lottery purchases increase, meaning that the more desperate people feel, the more they try to cling to this shred of hope. And that's not even, I feel like calling it a shred of hope is giving it more credit than it deserves. But they try to hang on to this idea that maybe they can have some miracle happen and they're gonna win the lottery. And it's a bad way to spend your money when you already don't have a lot to go around. If instead of buying a lottery ticket every week, you took $5 and invested it into the S&P 500 at an average 8% annual return, every week for 30 years, you'd wind up with over $30,000. Now that's certainly not a hundred million or a billion. Obviously $32,000 doesn't even touch that, but that's $32,000 that is in some way, shape and form guaranteed. I'm using that phrase loosely because returns are not ever guaranteed in an investment. But the point is that you're not just gonna go to zero. You're not gonna just burn that money. And $32,000 for somebody who's in a position where they're depending on the lottery to save them can actually be a life-changing amount of money. Whereas if you've just spent that money on lottery tickets or on any other sort of gambling or any other sort of vice, really, that money is burnt, it's gone, and you're never gonna see it again. And what would you rather have, $0 or $30,000? I know which one I'd pick. You really want something in this life, you have to work for it. Now quiet, they're about to announce the lottery numbers. 17. Don't! 32. Don't! 5. Don't! 8. Woohoo! 47. All of the vice industries, the industries that sell gambling products or alcohol or tobacco products or other drugs, all of them prey on people's desperation, people's insecurity, people's failing mental health, people's bad situations, and they exploit it. They take somebody who's already down and kick them 20 more times because, hey, when you kick them, sometimes money falls out. And I just think that it's incredibly seedy and scummy. And I'm not taking away people's agency to make their own decisions. I'm not saying that humans are all babies who need to have decisions made for them. Stupid babies need the most attention. Or who need to be told what they should and shouldn't spend their money on or how they should and shouldn't live their lives. But I think that people often have less agency than they think that they do. And I think that people often fall victim to marketing or to like wishful thinking a lot more often than they should just because they feel like it's their only chance. And in actuality, more often than not, it's just gonna make the situation significantly worse. If you're in a good financial spot, if you're out of debt, if you're paying all your bills, if everything is good, and you and your friends or you and your coworkers like to chip in together and buy some lottery tickets for fun every once in a while, just to be able to dream of the what ifs, I mean, I say go for it. Who am I to tell you what to do? But if you're living paycheck to paycheck or you're drowning in debt, not making your bills, really like flat out broke, if you are struggling financially, please don't be misled into believing that buying a lottery ticket or otherwise gambling is going to be the thing that gets you out of that situation because it's not. And over and above all of that, let's say on the 0.0000000001% chance that you struck it big in some form of gambling, if you don't have healthy financial habits, if you don't know how to manage your money, it's not even gonna help you because the majority of lottery winners wind up broke within just a few years anyways because they don't know how to manage their money or live within their means. Making money is absolutely one part of the equation, but what you do with it is almost more important. And so all of that is to say that just like the other 49 things we've talked about in this series so far across all 10 episodes, the lottery is a scam. And that's all I have for you guys today. Thank you guys so much for your support with this series. I've had a lot of fun filming it. I know a lot of you had really enjoyed watching it. And so I genuinely appreciate your support. If you enjoyed this video, please go ahead and hit that like button. Feel free to subscribe if you haven't done so yet. Thank you guys very much, by the way, for 50,000 subscribers. That's absolutely insane. You can follow me on Instagram at according underscore two underscore Nicole. As I mentioned, this will probably be the last video in this series for quite a while. I'm not gonna say forever for sure, but definitely for quite a while. I feel like I've exhausted this idea and it's enough. I'm personally over it. I can only imagine you guys are as well, but apparently you guys have seemed to like it. So here you go. Hope you're happy. 
I have a bunch more videos planned for the next several weeks and several months about lots of other cool things. So I do hope you stick around. If not, okay, bye, I guess, whatever. Take care, I'll see you guys next week.